They're picked for one thing only, which is empathy, being able to connect to another human being. And we have three of them per doctor. And their job is to build these relationships with patients and help them execute on these plans. You know, it's not that easy. Today's episode is sponsored by HEB Curbside and Delivery. When life throws you a loop, HEB Curbside and Delivery is here to help. We shop how you shop, so you get exactly what you want. Order today at HEB.com. HEB Curbside and Delivery, it's never been easier to shop HEB. I'm very excited to welcome our guest today, whose mission in healthcare is all about restoring humanity to healthcare. I had the great fortune to meet him when he was in Houston not too long ago, opening some clinics here for Iora Primary Health. So please welcome to our podcast today, Rushika Fernandopoule, the CEO of Iora Primary Health. Rushika, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. So what do you mean when you say you want to restore humanity to health care? What does that mean? So I think, you know, healthcare in the U.S., we have a lot of good people who are in it, uh, a lot of good intentions. I think the way we've designed their system, however, unfortunately, isn't serving us very well. It too often treats us as patients, or to be honest, as doctors or people working in healthcare without dignity. It's become a series of transactions, document, code, bill, you feel like a widget off a line. Uh, and too often, I think it robs us of our humanity. Healthcare is a, maybe one of the most inherent human things we do. Uh, it's when we come to it often with lots of vulnerabilities, and yet the system seems not to treat us that way. Uh, I think what a lot of people have done is sort of try to tweak the system, and we decided, what if we just started over and build a vision of what care could be uh, with this humanity in mind? So when you started it over, what, what were the elements that you put in place to make Iora stand out from others in the healthcare industry? Yeah, so the big thing is we decided to start over from scratch and build a model whose goal was to restore humanity, to actually improve health and keep people out of trouble. And what we realized is we had to change everything. Uh, probably at its core, we had to build a model not on transactions, but on relationships. So we called high impact relationship based care. So several things. So one is we had to change the business model. So what drives a lot of what people do in healthcare, like in any business, is how you get paid. And the way that people in primary care at least get paid in the U.S. is what's called fee-for-service. You get paid per doctor sick visit, and that's all you get paid for. And so we said we have to get out of that. We need to get paid not to do more things to people. We need to get paid to actually keep people healthy, so change the payment model. That allows us to then completely change the delivery model, to change what the team looks like, uh, change what the process is. So, so an example, you know, in a typical practice when you're paid fee for service, you as a doctor get paid to prescribe to people, tell them what to do. You actually don't give away whether they do it or not. <laughs> um, we said, no, 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 we want to actually, me telling you to do something is minorly interesting. You actually doing it and then improving your health. That's what's really interesting. So how do we do that? So we evolve these people we call health coaches. And they're from the community. They speak the language of the people they serve. Uh, they're picked for one thing only, which is empathy, being able to connect to another human being. And we have three of them per doctor. And their job is to build these relationships with patients and help them execute on these plans. You know, it's not that easy. So you know, wait a minute. I, I got, I got yeah. to back up. You said you pick people for this job, the health, co- the health care coach, based on empathy. That is your criterion for selecting them? Yes. I don't care what they did before, but the only thing I care about is that they can actually um, uh, form connections with other human beings because that's at the core of actually, in the end, this is about behavior change, right? And people change behavior when another human being uh, attaches them. So one of my favorite stories, uh, which I think you'll appreciate, we had a practice in a place called Atlantic City, New Jersey, where we were taking care of uh, folks. And we had a patient came in and I was a doc and the health coach came as a doc. There's a patient here. She's a hot mess. And, a you know, her mess. hair was a little, <laughs> hot mess. Hair was a little disheveled. She had a blank look on her face. She had diabetes and high blood pressure, not taking care of it in and out of the ER. And so we, 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 we sort of got her together. She had met her health coach. She started going with the program. I left that practice uh, because I was trying to figure out how to start a second one. And I came back six months later 
And the doc who took over, Dr. Neil Patel, who's now supervising a Houston practices, actually, he uh, he said, Rashika, remember the patient came in the first week, uh, Joyce was her name, uh, who we said was a hot mess, like, she's back, I want you to see her. So I walk in the room, and she looks like a different person. Hair is combed, a little makeup on, glint in her eye. Uh, she's back, you know, her, her diabetes and hypertension under control, no more ER visits. And I'm like, Joyce, you look amazing. And she said, Doc, I've never felt better in my life. And I said, Joyce, help me out. Tell me what we've done to help you. And she said something very profound. She said, Doc, you all cared about me. You taught me to care about myself. And I didn't want to let any of us down. You cared about me. You taught me to care about myself. Didn't want to let any of us down, right? That's what healthcare is about, right? We've forgotten that with all these protocols and transactions and billing codes and all this stuff. That's the sharp end of the sword. So that's why we pick health coaches who have empathy, who can build those sorts of relationships, and then all sorts of good things happen. What brought you to this point? Give us a little bit of your your backstory, and then I want to go. I want to. I want your medical backstory first, and then I want your personal backstory. So, talk about your <laughs> medical backstory. How did you start in the profession, and what what was the catalyst that 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 just made you move from what you were doing to start this whole new way of of looking at healthcare? So I'm a primary care doctor, you know, and I went into primary care because I wanted to help people. It's sort of, you know, it was trite, but that's, that's why I did it. Uh, and I remember actually very clearly, it was about 15 years ago, it was uh, about this time of year, I, I'm from Boston, it's where we're living. Uh, in Boston, uh, it's cold and dark at this time of year. <laughs> it gets dark at like 4.30. Uh, and I was in a typical practice and, you know, 30 patients booked. Uh, they had put a new electronic health record in. I didn't have time to fill out all the little clicks and things out of scrawl notes and piece of paper. And then after work, spent two hours trying to finish my notes so I could, you know, keep up with the RVUs and all the other garbage we had to do. And I remember there was a... Um, a partner, uh, one of my colleagues was sitting there with me doing the same thing. And she says, a very profound, she looked over to me and said, Rushika, every day I lose a little piece of my soul. Every day I lose a little piece of my soul. These patients come to us with such big needs and we train for such a long time and we can help them, but the system doesn't let me do it in the seven minutes and all this other stuff we do. And by the way, it's getting worse and not better. And I think that was the moment I said, you are exactly right. Like, this is going the wrong way. Like, this, this sort of, what everyone else is trying to eke the system better. And I said, no, no, no. Maybe we just have to start over and create a vision of what care ought to be and stop making excuses why we can't do the right thing because of the payment or the IT system or the whatever. Stop making excuses. Just do it. So that was the moment I decided we had to. We had to start over. Now, that was 15 years ago. It's taken a long, taken a long time. This is really, really hard. Uh, but it's doable, right? And I think there's a, what we've been able to do is sort of build a vision that's very, very different. What was it that attracted you to the healthcare profession in the first place? When did you know you wanted to become a doctor? And what, what, was, the, what was the reason? Yeah, you know, I've always, um, so my dad's a doc. Uh, now, I think there's some crazy percent, 80 something percentage of doctors tell their kids don't be doctors, right? So my dad was not in that category. Like he's always, he'd always liked it. I'd always sort of kind of figure out, do I want to be a doctor? Do I want to go into something? Like I've always been a system thinker and I thought about going into business or consulting. Again, I remember very clearly there was, uh, I was in college and uh, I had gone to this uh you know, consulting meeting, you know, the consulting companies would come on campus to recruit. And uh, there was one of these fancy receptions at the Charles Hotel, they'd give you little potatoes with the caviar on it. And uh, and one of their sales pitches to come be a consultant was, oh, if you come here, you only will have to deal with, you know, smart Ivy League educated people. And then I remember the next day, I'd flying home to go visit my parents and uh, visit my mom. And she, uh, she was cooking a meal and she said, oh, can you go over to our neighbor, Mrs. Dina Colo, and borrow some sugar or something? So I walked over and Mrs. Dina Colo was this amazing, like, older Italian woman. She and her husband had, had immigrated over, started a little tailor shop, and done really well because they did a really, they worked hard, they did really well, uh, and just incredible wisdom. And I sat there in the kitchen while she's getting the sugar and chatting with her, and I realized, wait a second, that consulting company, like, I don't want it for my life only with smart Ivy League educated people. What's great about medicine is you get to work with everyone. I guess you get to work with those people, but also people like Ms. Pinicolo, who, you know, came over from Italy with a tailor. And, uh, and I said, that's a great place, way to spend your life to do that. So that was the moment I decided to go to medicine and not do the other stuff. 
So you're a, peop- you're a people person. That That's obviously very clear. And you obviously have empathy for your, your fellow man. Um, tell me a little bit more about how you grew up, where you grew up, what your life was like growing up, and, and how all of that manifests itself in who you are today, how you show up, and how you, how you do your business. You know, it's a great question. So, I, uh, so I'm an immigrant, first generation. I think there's a lot of talk these days about immigrants. I, I didn't, wasn't born here. Born in a place called Sri Lanka. Uh, my family moved here when I was two and a half years old to Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, and so grew up in a, in a, at a time when there were very few folks from Sri Lanka or immigrants. You know, the late 60s when the first wave of sort of non-white, to be honest, immigrants were, were coming over. Uh, so... Um, I think always grew up saying, you know, we've given a whole lot here and need to sort of give back. And how do you sort of do that? And that's sort of part of what led to, as you saw, the decision to go go into medicine. You know, I think as I went through my training, you know, I actually had the opportunity to spend a lot of time uh, doing medical work in other countries. So I spent some time in Malaysia, spent some time in South Africa, in the Dominican Republic, in Russia, in Sri Lanka. Uh, and, and I think learned a lot. There, uh, so the whole idea of health coaches actually comes from community health workers that people have used in lots of other parts of the world. Uh, and they did it because they had to, because they couldn't afford doctors. So they try to create, pe- create people in the community. Uh, and I think, yeah, so, so in Malaysia, for instance, where I did some work, uh, the way they do their maternal care is they have a mom in every village. So within a five minute walk of like almost everyone, there's a mom. And in her hut, in her little house, uh, she has a big blackboard. And she has the names of every person in the village who's pregnant written down. And there's a checklist. So at week three, week four, week five, you, do they get the immunization? Do you check their weights? Make sure things are progressing. And she has a telephone. And so, first of all, no one falls through the cracks. Their immunization rate's 100%. If you don't show up, she goes to your house and says, mm. you know, hon, like, you need to get your shot. Like, let me give it to you. You know, no one falls through the cracks. And then if she sees something's wrong, then she calls up a nurse, and the nurse helps her through it. And then the nurse can't deal with then you go to a doctor. So they're you know, able to manage this stuff in an amazing, low-cost way that's actually fundamentally more um, – effective than what we do is by making women go to the doctor every week while they're pregnant. It's ludicrous to have a physician, you know, do routine checkups on people and me- have a physician measure your belly. Like, you do not need to go to medical school to do that, right? I mean, silly. Right. Or to jab a needle in your, someone's arm. You don't need to go to medical school to do that either. You can train people to do it. So, mm-hmm. so I think I learned a lot from um, other places. By the way, the, the, the name for these health coaches, I don't love the word health coach. It's sort of stuck. The name I like, Paul Farmer, is a guy who started to think called Partners in Health, and he works in Haiti and the Dominican Republic and places. He calls these people accompanators, one who accompanies you in the journey to health. Right? It's exactly who they are. Now, I can't spell accompanator, and no one else can, so that's why we don't call them accompanators, but, but that's yeah. exactly the, that's a the mouthful. point. And I think, yeah. But I think having that perspective, seeing how people have done things in other places has been very helpful as we've designed some of the things that Iora. Well, clearly you're, you're the sum of, of all the experiences that you've had. Um, I'm, I'm wondering when, when you were, when you made the decision to go to medical school and follow in your father's footsteps while creating your own path, of course, um, what obstacles, if any, did you run into? Did you ever have anybody tell you, you can't do that? Why would you even think you can do that? Did you have any experiences oh. like that? Well, so all the time, uh, you know, I, I had a high school guidance counselor, uh, Mr. Thompson. I still remember him. And uh, he gave me a piece of advice I have, I've never forgotten. He said, you know, there are going to be times in your life when people are going to tell you you can't do something. And what they really mean is that they can't do it. And so just take it with that. It means they can't do it. And that means, it means nothing about whether you can. And, and I think, you know, having done this for a long time, and, and it's been lots, it's been very hard, and lots of, you know, uh, not everyone likes it when you're an innovator. Uh, probably the only skill you need is uh, refusing to take no for an answer and mm-hmm. just figuring out how to ask the question differently and having some persistence to right. try something differently. Right. right. I think that gets, gets one a really far, long way. That's such an important message, I think. And, you know, one of, one of the reasons that, um, that I started this podcast, and we actually, you and I talked about this a little bit when I, when I met you here in Houston, 
is that I'm trying to help foster more civil discourse. My, my goal is that someone who is watching this podcast or listening to it who, um, you know, might not ever have met anyone from Sri Lanka or might not even know where it is, okay, um, might, you know, think, well, I don't know anybody who looks like that, who sounds like that, who comes from that part of the world. And then here you talk about your, your vision for helping other people and having empathy at the core. My goal is that somebody sees that in you and also can relate to it in, the, in, in their in themselves. Um, what What's your message to just to the overall community um, about accepting each other for who we are in all of our differences and having empathy at the core of how we walk through our lives? I think it's unbelievably important, right? We, in The one thing, it's great as being a doctor, you get to know a lot of people from a lot of different parts of life. And, and everyone actually wants the same thing. They want to, you know, be happy and raise their kids and make a difference in the world uh, and be treated with respect. And it doesn't matter if you're someone who's homeless who spends a night in a shelter, if you're a billionaire, right? It doesn't matter. You actually want those same things. We're all the same, right? And I think it's uh, it's actually one of the, the things, that, again, being a doctor, is we, you see when people get sick, it's an incredible equalizer of people and all the sort of fancy clothes go away and all the fancy cars go away and sort of doesn't matter, right? So, so I think we're all the same. Uh, and I think, um, you know, I, I think the other thing is like we can make a big difference, right? So, you know, it's easy to look at the, all the problems we have and feel despondent about it and say like, oh, we can't fix this. But, you know, we created these stupid problems. We can, we can fix these stupid problems. Yes. Uh, and all it takes is sort of people, you know, and, and, and you know, what's, what's amazing about Iora is, you know, having had the idea, we want to create a new model or something. And now we have 720 people, I think. We have 48 practices in 12 different cities, and it's become much bigger than me. And there are lots of people. You met several of our docs and our health coaches, and it's taking on momentum. And I think we're now actually trying to change them. We're actually making an impact on the world. I think everyone could do something like that. So for those who are watching and listening and may not have heard of Iora, you are in uh, Seattle, right? Phoenix. And you're now in Houston, about to move to Dallas. You're headquartered in Boston. What what city am I missing? Oh, so we're also in, uh, you've met Tucson, Denver, Seattle. We're in Atlanta. We're in uh, two cities in North Carolina in the Triad, which is Salem, and then we're in uh, Charlotte. We're in Boston, Hartford, Connecticut. We're in New York City in a little bit, and, and up in Hanover, New Hampshire. Yeah. yeah. And so your your primary target in terms of the population that you're reaching with Iora is those who are on Medicare, correct? Yeah. So right now, most of our practices are serving Medicare patients. Part of that is. Uh, our model, which is this high-impact relationship-based care model, uh, requires us to take population of people that we can keep with us for a while, right? This is sort of long-term thinking. Uh, and the nice thing about Medicare is once you're in Medicare, there's sort of only one way out of Medicare, right? You sort of check out the other end. Yeah. And so we can keep people, we think, for many, many years. And people in Medicare tend to be older and sicker, right? And and um, we have partnerships with great Medicare Advantage plans that allow us to get paid a different way. So Medicare works. We also, in, in some of our places, serve uh, folks from self-insured employers, people like the Boeing Company, the Teachers Association in Washington, the state employees in Massachusetts, and the mm-hmm. like. So um, really, our, our, our mission is to try and you know, restore humanity to everyone, and we're going to sort of do it as we get more payers willing to pay us differently. I see. So it's basically you have to start somewhere, and that was a strategic place to start. And then yes. as the model becomes successful and grows and, and becomes more accepted within the healthcare community, that would then allow you to go beyond the older population and, and, and reach everyone. Is that, am I understanding that, that correctly? Is exact, that is exactly right. Um, Iora just opened six clinics here in the Houston area. And one of the things that I love about what you do is that your clinics are in neighborhoods where people live. Now, we're fortunate here in, in Houston to be the home of the, the best medical center in the world. People come here from all over the world for health care. Yes. Um, and you're taking a different approach. I mean, you certainly can go to the medical center and get fantastic care. But what you're doing is actually 
opening up clinics in neighborhoods where people can get to you more easily. Talk a little bit about that strategy, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, so I think what we're trying to do is try to create change. I mean, so there's a top-down strategy, right, with these huge health systems, and if you need sort of complex care, that's exactly where you ought to go. But we think there's, you know, for primary care, you ought to, we ought to go bottom-up, and we ought to be where people are. So we put our practices not in medical office buildings, but in sort of strip malls where people are going anywhere, where there's, you know, a dollar store or a grocery store or, or something where they're going anyway and in the neighborhood. Uh, you know, we try to make it easy. So if, uh, you know, you need transportation, we'll actually send a Lyft or an Uber to come pick you up and we pay for it and drive you into the clinic. You know, once we meet in person, it's really important we meet in person. We can do a lot of stuff by text message and email. And if you can do video chat, we're happy to do that. And uh, because again, I think the whole idea is how can we sort of build this relationship and do it in sort of a continuous way and make it easy for you as a patient. What do you think will be the the greatest obstacles or maybe what even have been the greatest obstacles thus far to taking this completely new way of of looking at healthcare and expanding it throughout the system? Um, what kind of what kind of pushback are you getting or do you expect to get as you progress? Yes, I think from a lot this is very new. It's not a little different, it's completely different. And so I think uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of people in the current healthcare system who are making an awful lot of money off of keeping people sick, to be quite honest. <laughs> right? You know, that, that's what happens. You make money out of filling hospital beds and doing MRIs and doing procedures on people. And so you can imagine what we do, uh, the, the side effect of what we do by building these relationships is we make a dramatic impact on lowering unnecessary hospitalizations, ER visits, and procedures that people don't need. Uh, you can imagine the people who make their money living off those things don't necessarily like us. <laughs> uh, so I think uh, several things. One is uh, getting payers to pay us differently. You know, this is what we call value-based payment as opposed to fee-for-service. I think uh, we often get opposition from health systems who don't like the fact we're drying up some of their referrals. Um, I think getting patients and consumers to understand there's sort of a different way and we could try something different, you know, it's, it's a challenge. Um, getting docs, you know, who are willing to do things differently. So, so one of the things we're doing, by the way, is is really really thinking about how we uh, change the power dynamics, right? So we have these sort of bad power dynamics in healthcare that don't allow us as patients to fully take control of your health. This is part of restoring humanity. So, for instance, we are docs, and then and the same thing happens in our teams, right? Where between the teams, the doctors, the health coaches, we want to flatten the hierarchy. And so we do things like our doctors don't get to wear a white coat, they don't have a private parking place, they don't even have a private office, they sit in our huddle. We do huddles every morning where the whole team gets together and talks about patients. The doctor doesn't sit at the head of the table, they don't even run the huddle. The first thing we say every day is we all run the practice, we all run the huddle, we take turns. So as a doc, I get to run it every 12 days, but so does the nurse and the health coach and the operations assistant. So again, this is not for everyone, right? There are some doctors, I'm the captain of the ship, I need to be in charge. We're like, this is not the right place for you. But the docs that say, no, I want to be part of a team. Um, by the way, we tell the docs, you're still in charge. You're the most expensive person in this room. You're the most trained person in the room, but the way we lead is not from out front, we lead from the side. It's a different thing. So again, it's not for everyone. So we just need to find the people who want to do it, come over here. And then eventually what happens is more and more people see it and they say, this is not worse than what I'm doing. It's not scary. This is better. Can I come over? And then we gradually start building it up. You shared with us um, one of your favorite stories a little while ago. Is there another one that comes to mind that you might want to share as we wrap up our conversation? So, so we, we have a story of a patient of ours in Seattle, and she was an elderly lady who, um, you know, had grown up in Sacramento, and her husband passed away, and her daughter lived up in a suburb of Seattle and said, Mom, I want you to come live with me, sell the house, sell the car, move in with me, because she did, moved in with the daughter. Now, um, the, the problem is she's not getting isolated, right? The daughter had said, oh, I'll give you a ride wherever you want to go. But of course, the mom didn't want to burden her daughter. So she just stayed at home watching TV, was eating poorly, uh, just not engaged. Uh, diabetes, was, her blood sugars were getting out of control. So she came into our practice and we were huddled, right, where we talk about it. So the doctor said, you know, I'm really worried about this, this patient and her 
blood sugars, you think she needs more medicine. And the health coach, Corey was her name, said, no, the problem doc is she's not engaged. I need her engaged. And so that our, we have a social worker in every practice. So she said, you know, um, Moni was her name. Said, Do you, um, we have this group called It's My Story, where we get patients to come together to tell their story to each other. And she could meet some people there, and that would be great. Like, loneliness is a huge problem with being older in this country, uh, particularly when you lose your spouse. Um, and even if you've got living with your kids, but the daughter's busy, they said, why don't you come into this group? Well, okay, well, should we send an Uber together? Like, no, I want to teach her to ride the bus. So the next time we had this group, uh, the health coach, Corey, went out to this patient's house, gave her a bus pass, and said, okay, let's ride the bus in together. They rode the bus in together. They said, well, that wasn't too hard. Came to the group, loved it, met some people. On the way back, Corey said, okay, now you ride the bus home by yourself, but she had a cell phone. I'm right on my phone. Call me if you have a problem. She calls her when she gets home. I did it. It was easy. It was great. Starts riding the bus to come into the practice for the group, but even more importantly, started going to the mall and going to have coffee with people she met. And guess what? Her blood sugar got better, right? She got engaged. She started to have this reason for doing it. Now, now why does no one do that, right? Because no, most doctors think that they should do what they're paid for. And there's no CPT code, a code, billing code, for teach patient to ride bus, right? So they don't do it. And I think what's really transformational about this is to have empathetic people like Corey who could really figure out what the issue was and then not be restricted because of these stupid coding and billing stuff to be able to do how do I solve the problem for this patient and for her it was teach her to ride the bus and it completely changed her life it's a really low tech intervention this is not expensive uh, but it made such a big difference yes it's huge it's a huge difference it, it never ceases to amaze me every time I do another interview and talk to someone um, what, what I keep coming back to is that so much of what ails us as a society all comes down to empathy and connection. And if we can just find a way to have empathy for each other and connect with each other, so much of so many of the problems that we are dealing with would just go away. I completely agree. So I, I thank you for trying to highlight that and and and. and and doing the podcast. Well, thank you very much for uh, sharing your time with us today. Wish you the very best in your endeavors as you uh, as you overhaul the way healthcare is delivered to patients, um, keeping empathy at the core. Uh, Dr. Rushika Fernandapule, thank you so much. And um, we will continue to watch Iora's growth and we'll update our, our viewers um, and our listeners as you progress. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. We'll see you next time.